part of what I'm going to speak about is the whole world of digital change and consumerization uh, and what all of that means in the terms of the world of business change today. Don't leave that up there to read. So what we're going to cover, uh, I'll give you a brief introduction to myself, some of my experiences, uh, why I have sort of copious amounts of grey hair, unfortunately. Um, talk about then history of enabling change, what makes a successful change programme. There is a formula that sort of I've used over a number of years and it just works fundamentally. Um, the impact of digital and consumerization. so what has changed, what does that mean to us? Uh, new age change programmes that I'm seeing that are emerging and then how maybe as an IT function, as an IT sort of uh, world we can start to equip ourselves. So, introduction. These are some of the companies that I've worked for. There is the good, the bad, and the ugly, and all that sort of stuff. We'll start with the ugly, Torix Retail. Uh, I was there as Group IT Director. Uh, we was a, a ambition by the Chief Exec to acquire as many EPOS companies as possible and be the world's largest EPOS provider, which was fantastic uh, if there wasn't an underlying current of fraud taking place. So, <laughs> we had 16 businesses to integrate, while at the same time, then four directors blew the whistle on four others. Uh, so sitting as Group IT Director on top of all of this was quite an experience in itself when you've got 16 acquisitions you're trying to pull in, uh, while at the same time then you get a call from the Chief of Police of London City Police Station that says, you have to protect the data come what may. When four are saying, well, you might want to delete it, and the other four are saying, keep it. So that was somewhat of an experience in terms of the world of change. That gave me most of my grey hair. Um, the kids gave me the rest of it. Uh, so then Hovis. Hovis was a complete opposite. A business that was quite mature. Um, Premier Foods owned Hovis at the time. They had, a, had an express train called SAP. And it was coming to a town near you whether you liked it or whether you didn't. Naturally, the chief executive of Hovis said, I don't think so. Uh, day two after I joined Hovis, I called the, the, the CFO and said, I recommend you stop this program because in about a month's time, all of your bakeries will be out on strike. Hovis at the time, and still is, the second largest baker in the country, they manufacture a million loaves of bread a day. Just to give you the scale of what was about to happen. So, there was clearly a tension between the chief exec and Premier Foods, so we put the brakes on Premier Foods, we eased back the chief exec, we got the program sorted into the, in, in, into, uh, the flow of how it needed to go, we got the first sites live on SAP HR payroll, tension was released, and away we went. In between all of that, uh, so I have done work for, uh, for Seco, so I've got one of my former colleagues, Simon. Uh, we worked at the Seco sort of right in, back in the day, as they say. It was a fantastic business to work in, and currently I'm at OCS. So we have a major business transformation program about to kick off uh, and turning a UK business around. So they're in the facilities world, the same as Interserve. The other one to mention is Interserve, 1.8 billion facilities management services business. Uh, had tried to create a standard way of working <coughs> many times, had spent millions of pounds trying to do it, uh, and fundamentally was failing. And they couldn't understand or work out how they did it. But every time they won a contract, a facilities contract, they would reinvent all the technology, all the processes, and all of the data. And they did that to the degree that if, you're, if, if, if you had uh, a call to log, that business could log that same call in over 50 different ways. And then you could buy an item such as light bulb to service that call in 27 different ways. So it had created itself a bit of a, bit of a monster. So part of what we do with Interserve was to create that end-to-end -end operating model. And I'll talk about sort of more experiences as we go. So I'm not just going to share my experiences with you. Hopefully this will relate, you'll relate to some of this. If you want to talk about some of it afterwards, uh, more than happy to, to help and support that. So a bit of history. Traditional change programs. We've done scope. We've got requirements, detailed specifications. We go through, we go off and we build the thing as a world of IT, and then we said we play it back and we might go back. In between all of that, a lot of to and fro in, a lot of waterfall, takes a long period of time, and do we really sort of keep the audience engaged as we go through that process? Probably lose a lot of them along the way. And then it becomes more of a technology thing that we're putting in. So, often, technology is seen as the holy grail. If I have a penny for everybody who said to me, the latest app and it's going to light up the world and solve all my problems, I would be an uber rich man by now. Reality of life is there is no single application is gonna solve all of your problems. It's gonna bring more unless you wrap the whole business change cycle around it. So sometimes we ask for one of these, or maybe one of these, but quite often we get one of those, or we get one of those. 
Add to that, traditionally, there have not been enough intelligent buyers of, of technology. So, fundamentally, what makes a successful change program? So I've gone through the world of business and IT for the last 27 years. More latterly, sort of having brought all that experience together, there is, from my view, a fundamental methodology and approach that just works. So, first things, you start with business capabilities. You ask the business and the business processes. You ask the business, so how do they fundamentally want to run each part of their business? So if you are setting a call center up, how do you want to run the call center? What types of calls do you want to take in? How do you want to take those calls? How do you want to allocate those calls out? Fundamentally, challenge the business to say, how do you want to run that part of the business? Once you have that information, you have those processes, you're mapping those processes out, it is way easier then to map technologies that are going to deliver those processes married back to those capabilities that you go and sell and you go and deliver to your clients. Into this, there are four key themes. One is subject matter expert knowledge. When you're doing a change program, it is not about the technology. It is about a group of people being able to express and articulate how they want to take the business forward and you have a series of subject matter experts. Embrace them and sort of really challenge them to come out with how again they want to run the business and sort of go that, take that journey with them. A detailed plan. So part of when I was at Hovis, why it wasn't working was because the SAP consultants, their plan was 10 milestones on one page. You're trying to take a billion turnover business into the world of HR payroll on 10 milestones. Fundamentally, the business did not know how this program was going to implement, how it was going to affect them, and what the change was going to be. So a detailed plan that is articulated and communicated out. Stakeholder management, absolutely uber key. If you cannot get a relationship with your stakeholders, it is going to be an arduous and difficult journey. This needs to be done on their terms. Not on a technology terms, not on IT terms, on the terms within the business that actually allows them the room to breathe and they feel and they realize you're actually doing this for them rather than to them. Referring to that, a really robust communication and engagement plan, and thereon you have the recipe that I found. I could eat, sleep, repeat this, and I just know it fundamentally works. It isn't easy, because still a lot of people will say, and when we come back to sort of the, the emergence of an intelligent buyer, there is still a whole reliance on, well, IT, you've got all of the answers, and it's going to solve all my worldly problems for me. It is a challenge that you have to go back. If you cannot articulate your capabilities and what you're selling and what you're running and marry your processes to that, it will be a difficult journey. However, so that's my experience. That's what I found works. We applied this sort of same model when we went to InterServe. So three times we tried to create this operating model. We put this in front, and this is the part of the methodology and approach that we took and we got the model built. Now that model is now being rolled out. So, adding to that now, we've got this world of digital and this world of consumerization. So, what has changed? Technology has accelerated massively over the last 15 years. So the first IT role I, I had, just to sort of tell you how long ago I go, Windows 3.11 was just coming out. For the younger members of the audience who probably don't know what Windows 3.11 was, so we'll, we'll roll that forward. Um, and so there's just been a sort of a huge acceleration of technology over time. So, impact, there are a number of drivers that come in. Pace of technology. Technology is just moving at an uber rate in terms of what is being developed, how it's being developed, how we can do things. Connected devices. There are now 4.3 connected devices per adult globally. 20% 7% of all adults in the world use social media. Big data and analytics prediction that every five years there will be a ten times increase in data available to us. Right? <laughs> costs. So costs are reducing. Our ability to go and sort of get a credit card and light an app up and go and pay that is a lot easier. When you actually sort of go in you when you go forward and sort of consolidate out into the cloud and those sort of services again it sort of brings a different way in terms of being able to sort of to, to invest in technology, invest in applications. The intelligent buyer. So the, the emergence of these things, all of these, when these came out, when Apple introduced these, they didn't send a manual, an instruction book. It was a, here it is, and everybody just gets on with it around the world. And the apps that go on them, there are no training manuals, largely, with all these apps. You just carry on with it. And so that whole world of the intelligent buyer, it sort of forces you down a route of really being able to understand how maybe to get better things out of technology. Then you have the Internet of Things. So data can be captured. Multiple forms, multiple devices, real time, 
the explosion of these devices. I was reading something the other day that suggested by 2020 there will be 10 billion connected devices. Probably going to be more. Might be a few less, but a significant number. Disruptive forces. So the barriers to, entry, to enter into markets now are easier to overcome. Innovation is driving that faster. A lot of experiences around this world actually sort of says that if you want to go and disrupt the market, how are you going to go and do that? So you look out in terms of sort of the ways in which you can drive that through faster, better applications, better processes, uh, cleaner workflow, capturing data, single pieces of data at source. So all of these are impacting on this world of business change. That's driving the demand. So your chief exec is going to get wise to some or all of these and just expect us just to be able to go and deliver against all of these and just go faster. So from my perspective then, in terms of new age programs that I see sort of emerging, so you have your traditional business change that's coming up. So standardizing the core. So you have the big heavy transactional engines. You've got your ERP systems. You've got your HR systems, your Kaplan systems, whatever one the one. The ones that just crunch transactions. That's what they do is standardize that and get it off the table. Just let it carry on, eat, sleep, repeat, do what it does. Then you have process and data-driven change. So this is going faster, going cheaper, and being more informed. <laughs> Things such as process and workflow automation. So the rise of independent forms platforms. So being able to capture data, create forms, capture data at source, and just have that one version automate into your middleware, into your enter enterprise service bus, and allow that to flow as a single version of the truth back to your back office solutions. Process and application consolidation. I walked into OCS a few weeks ago, a business that turns over around about 600 million, and they have over 125 applications. When I stepped into Interserve, a business that turned over 1.8 billion, they had over 500 applications, largely all doing the same sort of thing. So there's a new world that actually says you can actually consolidate these more effectively. Uh, and you can journey these through by using other technologies. We can now capture more, there's going to be a requirement to capture more useful data. That's all. So capturing data is fine, but if all you get is a so what, then you may as well not capture it in the first place. But actually what we'll be able to do is pin down more accurately what data you truly want to collect and where you, what you want to do with it and how you want to analyze it. And then more meaningful insights. So we talk about big data, we talk about MI, data warehousing, analytics. It starts to become far more meaningful. The third element that, sort of that, that I've come across is bimodal. Low investment, rapid development, prototyping, and innovation. This is right out on the front end of the business, of the customer world, and looking at sort of, yeah, so you can develop what are called easy apps, or the ones that will add instant business value, ones that will add market disruptors. So you can put relatively low investment in on the front end. You can try a few things. If some of them work, then you start sort of to bring them in to your architecture and into your model. You can go device agnostic. So that we built the model at Interserve, I said, I don't really care. We started off, I said, I don't really care what name it is on the tin in terms of the application. I don't really care what name it is on the device either. It's a moot point. And the world expects that largely when you build these engines now, you can do this sort of thing and be completely device agnostic. Key thing there is always still control the demand and the emotion. A lot of people say, I like an iPhone or I like a Samsung or I like a, an application that does this, that, and the other. Key thing there is peel back the emotion and say, factually, what is actually going to service you and service the need of the business? in terms of meeting the requirement. Simplifying interfacing. So there is a world that exists around the world of enterprise serial buses, service buses, and uh, the world of middleware that will allow you, even if you've got a very disparate estate of applications, you can connect them in and you can take one version of the truth and it'll allow you to slowly peel these applications back and roadmap them out. And then connecting devices. So people, the internet of things, <coughs> is only going to go one way. And it's, if it isn't in a town near you now, it will be sort of very soon, and it's probably going to accelerate. Then we have all of this, this sort of cloudy and security type stuff that you know, it just works, doesn't it? Sort of that goes with the given. So um, across all of those, so those three, this is my experience, all three of those will overlap. So there is no single one for me that you can take individually. All three of these will overlap. And that's what you sort of need to embrace to sort of understand and get, that around, get your heads around that. So, in terms of how then the IT function can equip themselves, so I've taken assumption, <laughs> I have taken assumption here that there's something that says keep doing, we are doing it already, and the start doing, we maybe not be doing it, but if you are and you're doing all of these, fantastic. If you're not, then don't worry about it and start going into them. So keep doing, be business driven. 
do not be IT driven in terms of delivering business change. Joint ownership is key, stakeholder management absolutely key, and deliver. If you say you are going to go and do something, do it and deliver and get it across the line. The credence it will give you with your stakeholders is massive. And it also allows you to buy the time when things maybe don't quote, quite go right. Adopt to the pace of change, but be realistic. Do not go and promise the earth and say, yes, we can deliver all this massive change in a few weeks, the world is going to be wonderful, and we can all go off down the pub. Because if one thing is guaranteed, somebody's going to come and excuse the expression, but piss on at you and make it really difficult for you. Promote one version of the truth. Every business I have stepped into, they have not known what the single version of the truth is, to some degree, greater or lesser. If you can get to that single version of the truth and promote that, it makes a huge difference to the business, because you go fact-based, and you understand when you go into that whole world of business change, factually, you are correct. Whether you like the outcome or not is another matter, but actually it drives you to get to the right outcomes if you want to move there. So understand what consumerization can do for your business. There's a, many people have come to me and say, oh, I want one of these. Oh, I want one of those. It's like, oh, I say, so what? Oh, okay, whether you want one of those, whether you don't want one of those. It's actually sort of, it's what are you going to do with it? So just be wary of where consumerization can play in your business versus maybe what's just a nice to have or isn't actually going to derive you any value. Get into Agile, continue with Agile design development. So how we build the operating model at InterServe <coughs> is rather than go through a traditional waterfall and then wait and then we build something, we play it back. Essentially what we did was we built the model and as we were building the processes, a slight step behind that, we were building the technology and we were configuring the technology. So we then got to natural stage gates where we just were able to go faster. Things you can start doing, if you're not doing them already, a change, approach change holistically. Go end to end. So if you're going to fix something within a uh, function or a department, understand what the ripple effects are upstream and downstream. Understand what feeds it and what takes the output. Because we can guarantee that if you don't, something will come along and say, you didn't think about this or you didn't consider that. So you need to go holistically around that chain of events that's really going to drive that business change. Move to bimodal IT. Um, so obviously that came up this morning in terms of that. So again, this is sort of that go to that, that front end. Combine that with innovating like a startup. Your chief exec will love this. He'll actually think that you've got a handle on it and get to the front end. But the whole key part of these two is to stop your colleagues going out and saying, I've got a credit card, I've got the latest app, and I'm just going to go and sort of line up, sign up for it. The next thing you know is you've got a proliferation of a boatload more apps, a load more change, and that's disrupting and getting in the way of actually what you're trying to achieve. Change the mix of SMEs. So introduce the graduates. These guys are coming out of sort of college, out of university now, high level of idea, they really understand this. This is where sort of the, the, the true emergence of the intelligent buyer is going to sort of take its place and it's going to come to the fore. Get those into the mix of your change programs. Move the IT function close to the customer. If you combine, if you go bimodal and innovating and the graduates, move the whole thing, get yourself closer to sales, get yourself closer to the customer. Makes a huge difference because you can actually control the demand at the front end rather than waiting it for it to hit you and come down the line and then you've got to all work it out. Get closer to marketing. They are your new best friend. They love all this sort of technology stuff. I'm like, well, I want up for you then. Um, so those are the things in terms of, for me, to, to either keep doing or start doing if you're not doing them already. So then finally, I'll just leave you with two <coughs> predictions. I would imagine that your business probably needs far fewer processes and applications than it already has today. And I would expect in the next five to 10 years, the IT function will not exist, will not need to exist as it does today. Thank you. I'm, I'm curious to know what you imagine the IT function will look like then in five to 10 years. Yeah, so, um, so I see sort of with this, this whole world of the, the, the intelligent buyer um, and where applications are going, is that you will effectively move the ownership of applications and the ownership of data out into operations. And you'll be able to control it there rather than necessarily having to control it in the IT function. So you'll have all of your, the cloud, the infrastructure, all that is a given, is an expected given. And then this whole world of who manages, who owns, who runs apps, who owns data, would actually sort of drive it out. So I would naturally see a move of moving the IT team out. And this is where it gets closer to the customer, is move the IT team up that value chain so that IT as it exists today won't be the same. Okay.
Bold statement. <laughs> Um, do we have any uh, questions from the audience? Okay, gentlemen, just down there, please. Where are our microphones? Thanks, Paul. Thank you. Hi, Richard. Hi. Dave Jones, Cape PLC. Hi, Dave. Um, at Interserve, when you realised you had 500 applications, how did you go about deciding which ones you needed and which ones you didn't? So part of what we did, we, we said about... Um, the model, it was quite easy to say, well, if we're sort of from the IT function, you'd have a lens that says we're repeating all of this stuff. From the business function, we've got a requirement and it's all about sort of the contract. So the whole, the key unlock of this was playing all of this back to the board that said, first stage was, this is what you've got. And the cost of doing all of this X times over is a derivative of how you've run the business. So the first point was really to get the board and their mind in the space that said, fundamentally, we need to just do this in a different way. And so rather than driving it, and they were all saying, well, you can we consolidate all these apps out in IT, I was absolutely adamant. They said, when you come back and said, well, but which ones? Which ones are going to service your requirements, your capabilities, and your processes? So that's where we drove it that way. And once we got out of that, it was then quite easy to say, well, actually, these are the ones that would be go forward. And you set your strategy, and when, which ones effectively then drop out. We were also, we brought in um, a couple of new applications. There was one product we brought in called Evoca which was forms-based data capture. Um, and the first thing we did was we, sort of we lined up eight audit solutions, and we wiped out eight audit solutions by putting in this tool. But that forms capture wasn't just about audit. You could go and use that whether you wanted to use that for delivery notes, whether you wanted to use it for other areas for QC, other areas for starters, for levers, whatever you wanted to do, <coughs> one application effectively, then it started to allow us to consolidate loads and loads of applications. That one in itself would probably take over 100 applications out. And this is, the pole point was play it back to the board, say this is what you've got, this is the vision in terms of where we're going, and then start that journey with them and get them to back it. 